Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitamount.com and Peel Combs Asian Art, located here in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And today is Monday, November 19th, 2018. And uh, as I mentioned last week, in last week's video, we're going to take a look ahead at the uh, November sales coming up in Hong Kong, starting in the last uh, few days of the month. Some great catalogs. And uh, it seems this time around, Christie's, as I mentioned before, got the lion's share of the major stuff. And uh, Chris, Sotheby's got some good things, too. Don't don't think I, I'm, I'm, I'm down on Sotheby's. I'm not. A while ago, Sotheby's had all the great stuff. This time around, it just happens to be Christie's. And uh, what they have is amazing. And one of the catalogs is this, the Multifarious Colors, uh, three enameled masterpieces. And, and uh, they're all uh, 18th century examples. We're going to take a look at them because it's pretty amazing uh, items. And we're going to start with this, this absolutely great Yang Kai uh, Hu form vase with a 100 deer pattern. And what's so interesting about this vase is, one, it has uh, no um, family sale history. It's been in the same collection since 1920, which is going to do a, a great deal to push the price on this. The other thing that's most rare about this vase are the handles. All right, It has blue handles. Uh, the, the majority of these vases do not have blue handles. They have either uh, gold handles, um, and we've seen them in the last few years, or the, or, or the reddish-orange handles that you often see. The other thing that's uh, interesting about this vase is the quality of the color seems to be, a, the decoration seems to be a step above some of the other examples we've seen in the last few years. The coloration on this vase is absolutely uh, perfect. Uh, just a superb example, and I think I think better than uh, a couple of the others we've seen that have done very well. It has a big estimate on it, though. It's got a very big estimate, and we'll see how it does. But uh, here, here are the blue handles, that almost lapis lazuli color, very elegant color. But note the shading. If you come and look at these, uh, this vase and you blow it up, notice the shading of the blue. It goes from almost a, 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 this, this tone down here. It's like, like light, light, light blue to sort of this aqua blue. And then it shades over into darker colors. The shading, the control of the shading of these enamels was just fantastic. And also the way the rocks are done, the stepping out of the rocks on this uh, piece are just fantastic. Um, we'll get a, a, another look at it here uh, up close. The way these rocks are uh, 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 decorated in, in, with black highlights and then, and then the shading of the colors darkening towards the top. Just a beautiful, beautiful uh, piece. And we'll see how it does, okay? And now we're going to hop over to um, this example. This is the uh, Jade Sp Spring Hill vase. Uh, it's getting an awful lot of attention. It's sort of on the par with um, the uh, vase that was found in the shoebox, the infamous shoebox vase that was found in Paris a few years, uh, a year, just not even a year ago, about eight months ago that was auctioned. And it brought 16.6 .6 million euros or around $19 million U.S. So I'll be very curious to see how this vase does. And it may do better. Uh, for one reason, is that it has a poem in it that was written by, by Chin Lung when he was a prince. Uh, Chin Lung was a, was a, a, a huge fan of poetry, um, and um, this, this, this particular vase has a, uh, a, a poem that he, he wrote, and he wanted it, they, they put it on there as a tribute to him. And there's a very long write-up of the history of the vase, of, of, uh, of, 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 of Chin Lung's poetry, the coloring, and all that. There's a real thesis on it. And what's really interesting is that the scene on the vase itself is based off of this, okay? The, the uh, lotus and bright sunlight in the Garden of Tranquil Brightness at, this, at, the, at the Summer Palace. And here it is, okay? And they identify the buildings, all right? This is on a painting. And then come over here. Here's the vase. Here's what was on the vase, okay? So it'll be very interesting to see how this does. Um, scroll across to here there's the poem there's the vase it is estimate upon request all right obviously because of the uh, the, the value okay and it had been in the in the, in the Triang collection in Hong Kong and it sold in Hong Kong um, at Sotheby's in uh, about 18 years ago all right so if you really want to know what it sold for then not that it matters anymore you can go look for the fun of it all right but this is a small vase it's about seven inches tall and the decoration on it is just out of this world. It was probably done under the directorship of Tang Ying when he was running the Imperial Kilns. He was the famous kiln director between, who came in during the Yongshen period and stayed into, into the Qinlung period for a decade and a half or so. All right. But this is uh, quite a piece. And it'll be exciting to see what this thing brings. And, of course, it's Mark and period 
um, uh, on the bottom. And then last is a, a very nice um, uh, brocade vase. All right. And if we get the page to respond, uh, let's uh, hop over to it. It is on page 70. There it is. This really beautiful brocade flower jar. All right, it's just a little over uh, six and three quarter inches tall, uh, but wonderfully painted and estimated at one to one point five million dollars. They also this pattern can also be seen in bowls and other objects, but this one is particularly successfully done. Uh, the spacing is very good. The coloration is excellent. Really nice, soft, very soothing, soft palette on this, and against this wonderfully white background. Um, and we'll see how that goes. It should do fine, all right? But it's an, it's, it's an interesting time, and this stuff is going to be sort of a test of the market to see how things do. And then we come over here to important Chinese ceramics and works of art. They have a lot of great stuff in this catalog, I just have to say, right off the bat. One of my favorites in here, and it's not the most expensive thing, but I'm going to point it out because I just happen to like it, is this, this really nice uh, Yuhu Chunping Yuan Dynasty cobalt blue uh, ground uh, vase. I love the shape of this vase. I like monochromes in general, but I love the shape of this this beautiful pear-shaped body. Um, and you can you can enlarge it and get a good look at it. You see the looting line. It's got a little a few scuff marks on the surface. I suspect the lighting is making them look worse. But um, this is a very nice vase. And uh, what I'm very glad they did was they showed the bottom of it. Because that's what the foot rim on one of these should look like. And you can see the cut lines. You see they used a knife right here to trim around it and to trim this here. And there's some bits of iron oxide that was in the paste that emerged when it was fired. We have this nice little iron line along there. And just a beautiful example. And it's 10 inches tall and it's estimated at three hundred ninety to $640,000. But uh, fairly unusual. These do not turn up on the market very often. All right. And then we're going to hop over here. And this is sort of, this was a surprise to me because it was just a month or so ago that we saw um, this one turned up in a collection. Okay. And this was also in Hong Kong. And uh, as I recall, it brought about $660,000. A nearly identical plate. Um, it is uh, just about the same size, I believe, uh, within, within an inch. And we'll see how it does. And this one is estimated at four hundred fifty to seven hundred thousand dollars, which means it's going to sell. All right, because the because the last one brought almost seven hundred thousand, and that means the reserve on this is under four hundred and fifty thousand. So I think it's got a pretty good chance of getting off the blocks. And um, you can almost pair it with the one that just sold a few weeks uh, a month or so ago. All right, and then we're going to hop over here. This is that's all. That was a young low period piece. This is also a young low period. Uh, beautiful ewer, about 11 inches tall, uh, cobalt blue, uh, really really fine quality. And uh, this this had been sold. Uh, let me see here. When had this been sold uh, most recently? Uh, in 2002, Hong Kong sold. It, it saw the beast. All right, and uh, oh, Christie's Hong Kong. Excuse me, Christie's sold it. So we'll see how it does. Um, I'll be very curious, but this is a, 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 another great rarity based on a Middle Eastern form. As you know, a lot of these early Chinese ceramics were be based on Middle Eastern forms that were introduced through trade starting in the Yuan Dynasty into the Ming. And uh, we'll see how this does. But it's just an absolutely uh, a beautifully painted object. Nice colors. And uh, then we're going to go on to, I think, what will obviously be the main event of this catalog, uh, the, uh, the Kangxi 12 Blue and White Month Cups. And what's really interesting about these is that uh, uh, month cups, Kung Chi month cups, were done um, in colors. Um, not often, but they did do them in colors, and they're more common. There are only six complete sets of 12 um, underglazed blue month cups known. All right, and these are the, the, one of the reasons is they're extremely delicate. These are all painted on eggshell porcelain, and um, the deal with a month cup is basically this: is that on on uh, they have flowers that represent each month. Of each season, okay, and these are estimate on request, by the way. And um, during the Kangxi period, they would paint a flower on the, on on a, t a specific flower for the for the time, and then a poem that would go with it, okay, that corresponded to each cup. And these were Tang poems, okay. Uh, Kangxi was a big fan of poetry from the Tang Dynasty in particular, and um, they applied these the the poem from the specific from that period for that flower to each cup. 
So these, it makes them very, very rare. And thankfully, Christie's included pictures of all of them, front and back, and the bases, and the rain marks. All right, so you can flip through them. Um, these are so thinly potted that you can actually quite, if you lift up one, you can look through it from the inside with a little light. You can very clearly see the exterior decoration. These are very, very thin pieces. And um, I suspect they'll bring um, 15 to $25 million, somewhere in there. Uh, they're impossible to, it's impossible to be more precise because they, there just aren't any comps to look at. They don't know um, when the last ones were on the market, but I suspect, uh, I, I can't think of when they were on the market in blue. So we'll see how they do, but I, I, I think they'll do uh, extremely well as long as they don't go too far on the, uh, um, on the estimate. All right. And then we're going to hop over to here. There's this, this very nice Sandwau hexagonal vase. Uh, it's about 27 inches tall, tw just a little under, 26 and change tall. All right. It's estimated at 770 to $1 million, 770000 to $1 million. And I'm pointing this out because a number of these, these are ubiquitous on the fake uh, porcelain market, as are some of those young low pieces. All right. This is a real one, and we'll see what it does. As I said, it's estimated up to a million dollars. Um, the, the, the repros that turn up on the market, of course, bring, you know, four, five, ten thousand because people think they got just got incredibly lucky, you know, they found one at an auction house in America that no one's seen before. All right. This is a real one. It's beautifully done. And uh, this one sold at Sotheby's or at uh, uh, Christie's, rather, Hong Kong about about 11 years ago. All right. Again, another piece that's coming back onto the market after a relatively short period of time. And I always get nervous when I see that uh, for the consigner because it, it, you don't know if it's going to sell. Is, is that too soon to come back on the market? All right. Oh, stuff that's been in collections for a long time, it's always the right time to put them in the market. But things that have been in and out of the market, well, it, it can be a little bit tricky. And it's, it's, it's sold uh, twice. This has sold twice in the last 20 years. All right, so it's a well-known vase, and we'll see how it does. And then we're going to move over to this. This is this is a fascinating thing. This is a piece of jadeite carved in the late 19th century incense burner, obviously. And this is this is uh, called water jade. Um, it's a type of jadeite, and the reason they call it water jade is it's so reflective. And uh, they they didn't even carve the they didn't carve the body because the the carver obviously wanted to be able to see the quality of the stone. This is gem quality jadeite, and it's a very rare color. The light reflects out of it, goes in and reflects out, and the piece just glows. Just a, a really stupendous piece of jade, and the carving is very good as well, obviously. And we'll see how it does. This is estimate on request which is very unusual for a late 19th century piece of jade, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little curious to see how this does. They've got, I think, very, very high hopes for it. It's also on a fantastic, it looks like a Zetan stand, um, which, of course, doesn't hurt, all right? But uh, amazing quality jade, and we'll see how, it, how, how, how well it does, all right? And then we're going to hop over here to this. This is this uh, uh, absolutely fantastic uh, Kangxi to Yongchen period um, lacquer table. They're very hard to date on these. There's a long write-up at the beginning of this, and and, and uh, because I, I was wondering the same thing, how do, how the heck would you date this thing? Uh, because this, the 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 method of its making and how it's carved utilizes two lacquer techniques that were developed long before, long before going back I think to the Han Dynasty, and uh, it was a popular technique again in the Song and then continued on. But um, they know a little bit about this uh, table. And what's really interesting is that, uh, by the, the history of this is that it was in the, in the um, uh, Tangxi Temple, um, which is uh, outside of the western side of Beijing, um, which is one of the most important Buddhist temples in all of China. All right, and uh, by family uh, repute, uh, George Tabor, or Trebor, the previous owner, had had gotten it out of the out of that palace somehow or from a, somebody that did. Um, it's a little bit of a mystery how they got it, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if the Chinese government came around and said we want that back. All right, but uh, we'll see. But a fantastically rare table, uh, drag is carved with dragons. We can pull it up a little bit, and uh, and it's in amazing condition. I have to say, it's in absolutely fantastic condition um, for a table that was in a temple. All right, and uh, there's minor scuffs and bumps around from feet, 
around the base, which is very typical, but the rest of it looks uh, just great. There's a slight, there's a little crack here due to shrinkage and that kind of thing, but an absolutely great table. And it's estimated at 620 to uh, $700,000. All right. So we'll, we'll follow that along and see, see how it does. And then um, last, I think we have one more thing in here to look at, is this. These are uh, unbelievably rare, uh, a pair of uh, 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 Yongshen period peach dishes. And these are the very small ones. They're only 13 centimeters or about five inches in diameter. They had originally come out of the collection of Barbara Hutton. Uh, the Huttons were big Chinese art collectors. Um, um, believe it or not, if you didn't know, huge. As a matter of fact, I stayed in I stayed in a home in Italy years ago, where they had given the family as a gift a, um, um, a 18th century jade uh, incense burner that's about a foot wide as a, as a thank you gift for staying in this house. But it was quite a house, and um, I was there staying, visiting the family friends and. It was on the table, and I said, "Wow, where'd you get that?" And they said it was a gift from the from the Hottons. All right, well, this was something else they owned. Um, absolutely rare piece. Um, it has been for sale last about uh, eight years ago. The pair, and they're estimated at three point six to four point five million dollars. These are eight peach plates that were made for the Emperor Qinlung on his birthdays. Um, unbelievably rare, and the symbols of the peach and the symbols of the bats. Um, you, you can you can read about them in the uh, article that accompanies this uh, this piece. Again, wrote, written by Rosemary Scott. And then last, you have this very rare lime green um, gr lime ground famille rose uh, and iron red imperial poem teapot and cover uh, with a cover Jai Jing Markin period. Uh, again, a, a, a great rarity. Uh, sort of the last of the really high end Qing stuff. All right, this is, was one of them. If, it could have just as easily been dated Chin Lung as, uh, as uh, uh, Jai Ching, and um, we'll see how that does. But uh, it sold at Christie's about 12 years ago, and uh, you can go look that up if, if, you, if you want to. All righty. And now we're going to hop over here to the big event of the day, or the big event of the month, is this, the Beyond Compare uh, catalog. And this was a catalog that was, uh, uh, the contents of which were sort of inspired by the artist Suji. And he was a 12th century artist, uh, uh, legendarily uh, skilled, talented. He was a Renaissance man of his time. And there's a great abstract written at the beginning of this uh, by John Stone that explains the, the art, because there's some modern art in here that is still uh, reminiscent of uh, the inspirations of Sung artists, all right? And uh, there's actually a painting in here by Zhu Xi. We're going to look at that in a second. But the first thing we're going to look at is this spindle leg table. Spindle leg tables are extremely rare. This is a Song Dynasty one. They were known before this. They found them in tombs, tombs in the uh, uh, Han Dynasty, I believe. Um, and they're not big. This looks like a big table. Okay, this isn't. This table is only 19 inches tall and about 45 inches or 43 inches long. It's not a very big table, but what it is is unbelievably rare. And this form disappeared, um, you know, sort of by the Ming Dynasty. They didn't really use it much, um, and it was meant to be sat at on the ground, with the table in front of you to eat off of. All right, but a very rare thing. And it's estimated. This is the thing that struck me funny. It's an extremely rare table. It's estimated at three hundred ninety to six hundred forty thousand dollars. Now that estimate might be just because they don't know what to estimate it at. They may not have a reasonable comp to go by, so they're giving it a sort of a, a squishy estimate, I suspect. Because if you're a Chinese furniture collector, you, you, you know that the most of the furniture you get is not, not dating to the Song Dynasty. It's dating to the sort of the mid-late Ming period, okay? So we'll see how that does, all right? And then over to this. This is a really interesting thing. This is a, a, a you know what it is, a fly whisk, obviously. But uh, fly whisks were very important. Um, uh, for, for Buddhists, the reason they used them was, was a, one, it was a demonstration of authority, but the belief was that with a fly wish, you wouldn't kill the flies because Buddhists do not believe in killing flies. So he swips this thing around and swish the fly away. This particular whisk, um, done in lacquer, was brought to a temple from uh, China to Japan around 1676. And uh, it's done in this uh, very fine, this tixi, pat, tixi technique. 
uh, you know, red to black, carving through the layers. But the, the condition of it looks really amazing. And the, and the hair on these were either horse hair or yak hair, other animals, any animal that had long hair, you could make a whisk out of it. This is one of them. And they believe this is the, paint, the whisk that's in this painting right here. Um, this was a, 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 let's see, this was done in mid uh, 1800s, all right? And it's in the Tokyo National Museum archives. Alrighty, so we'll see how that does. It's it's quite a thing, and there's a good write-up on it. And you don't see these early whisks turn up on the market at all, hardly ever. All right, and then you have the really big event of this of this sale and of the month over there, is this. It's the Ruware Bowl, the Star in the Morning Ruware Tea Bowl, and the thing that is that this tea bowl was unknown two years ago, three years ago. Um, it, it was brought into um, one of the Japanese museums. Um, when they were putting together an exhibition and it was sort of a you know bring in some things if you got something worthwhile we'll take a look at it maybe we'll put it in the show and this was brought in and we came in with a box that just said uh sell it on chawan which is uh, you know japanese bowl uh tea bowl and um there's a great write-up that explains how they came in with it it's sort of it's sort of a, a crazy story almost like the lady in france with the with that with that enamel vase that turned up um, they brought it in, and they, they almost fell out of their chairs. Mr. Kobayashi was the original fellow who looked at it at the museum, and they passed it around. They brought in other experts to examine it, and they determined that it was authentic. And as you know, there's only 90 of these, these rue pieces known in the world. Most of them are in museums, so it'll be really interesting to see how it goes. It has been repaired, all right, up here. It has an old lacquer repair. Apparently it got dropped and broken. And they went through and they checked all the broken pieces to make sure they're from the original bowl, which they were, okay? And this is the photo of when it was first exhibited just two years ago at, at, the, at the museum exhibition. But a newly discovered piece of rouware is extremely unusual. And uh, it should do very well. It is an estimate on request item, uh, but there's a, there's a lot of interest in this piece. And I suspect it'll, it'll, it'll do extremely well. Here's a better picture of it. There it is. And it's for the color. This bowl has a slight crackle to it. You can't really see it here. You can see it in some of the interior shots. But the color is just stupendous. And you have to remember that Ruware was made for the imperial family, all of it. And then what would happen is they would send over to the imperial house the Rue pieces that they'd made. And then the emperor could pick out what he liked and everything else was sent back. And those pieces then could be sold into the market. But um, he, the cream of the crop was kept by the emperor. And the other thing that's very interesting about this bowl is the bottom. All right. As you know, if you follow, looked at Rue, where uh, there's always those little seed marks on the bottom from the, from, the, from, the, from the spurs that held the piece up during the firing because the foot room would be glazed. And they wanted to get it up off the floor of the kiln. So you'd see a number of these spurs on the bottom. You don't see them here. In this particular case, and on, on rare cases, um, and, and some of the shards they found, uh, Ruware, they used the spurs on the, f on the foot rim, right there, there, and there. Just three of them. Talk about a precarious firing. They put it on the foot rim and hoped it didn't tip over and get messed up. So you end up with a cleaner looking bottom. All right. And this was quite a trick. And here you can see the crackle. It's a very, very fine, faint crackle in the glaze. You see it down around the bottom. That beautiful controlled crackle. All right, and this, as you, as you, as I said, is estimate on request. I suspect, uh, based on what other pieces have brought and so forth, you know, I suspect it'll bring twenty-five or thirty-five million dollars. So we'll see. All right, but it wouldn't surprise me. But the market right now is a little tough, so it's hard to say. But when something like this turns up, um, wealthy collectors seem to find a way to get into it. And we'll see. And the next great piece that's in the sale is this. And uh, this is an absolutely fantastic Canuta green, Canuta colored uh, mallet vase, all right? Um, these are unbelievably rare, also from a Japanese collection. And the form, if you didn't know, just in case they did include a picture of it, is based on an Iranian glass form from the 9th century. And there's a picture of it right there. And uh, here's the vase in the, from the 11th century or so that they decided to make uh, from ceramic. All right, it has this nice old box with it. There's a good write-up written by Rosemary Scott, who always does a great thing, and she's very readable. So you really should take advantage of 
you know, come over to bitemout.com, find the bookcase. It's on the home page or on the forum page is a reference thing. Click it. It'll bring you to, you can go look at the catalog, okay? And um, there's a nice section in here on some other comps, including a rare rueware piece. Looks like it might have had a flattened mouth on it that got uh, knocked off at some point. They put the, the gold uh, mount on it or the silver mount. And there's a, a lot of writing in here. And here's that, value, here's that vase right there. That's how it looks uh, set up with flowers in an appropriate setting. Just beautiful, beautiful green. The color, the glaze of this, this particular vase is absolutely fabulous. And uh, it is estimate on request. And uh, I suspect it will it'll do very, very well as, uh, as well as everything else. And the next thing and the, the last thing in this catalog we're going to look at is a, a, a very important, and I can't say that enough about this, this is a very, very important Song Dynasty painting by Su Shi. And he was the scholar that is sort of the, 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 uh, the, the stimulation for this, this catalog and the way it was set up of the period. He was a, he was a, a, a brilliant uh, uh, painter. And almost none of his paintings are known to have lasted. This is wooden rock. And it has had, had a succession of uh, prominent collectors, as you can see, by all the seal marks on it number of well-known collectors put their own colophons and attach them to the painting, um, attesting to its, its fabulous, quali fabulous quality and imagery. And uh, this guy was a purist artist. And we'll see how this painting does. I think it is, all, I'm sure it's also estimate on request. Um, um, a few years ago, we saw a uh, uh, Chin Lung, in, uh, somebody painting that had been in the Chin Lung collection, I remember, sold for $47 million. I don't know if this will get up to 47 million, but it's it's going to get way up there because there just aren't any works by this artist um, that'll ever be owned privately. There's a few in museums, and that's about it. All right. So this is quite a uh, quite a great uh, thing. It this also was in a museum once, but it got passed along to a, a new owner. All righty. So uh, we'll see how that does. And then on to this, the Yang de Tang collection, part two. Uh, you remember they did the Yang de Tang collection of Early Jades Part 1 uh, about a year ago. And before that, they did Chinese, their ceramics collection. It was the, the, that wonderful catalog that had those two pear-shaped um, garlic mouth uh, celadon vases with iron splashes on it. Well, this is now Yang de Tang collection Part 2. And what I loved about this catalog in particular was that um, if you scroll, go into it, there's this whole section at the beginning on the making of jade, the, there's a good forward in it, but there's, a, there's an article in here written by Dr. Zhu Lin, and he goes through um, the, the essentials of carving jade and how they'd go about it in, in phases and steps. Lots of information if you're a jade lover. This is a must read, you really have to read this, uh, including illustrations of jade carvers that were done on paintings and so forth, and goes right into it, all right? There's a lot of information in this particular catalog um, on, on, on how jades were carved and worked. Okay, the, the lapidary involvement. It's just uh, really well worth going through. And then you get into the catalog of the objects of the jades. Um, they're nothing to be uh, sneezed at at all. You have these absolutely fantastic early um, um, Zhai dynasty uh, piece, which are uh, unbelievably rare, estimated 100 to 150 thousand dollars, and uh, my favorite, though I mentioned last week, were the uh, stags. Where the heck are they? I thought they were just elegant. Here they are. All right, these, these uh, jade stags. I love the racks on them. The way they were done, very exuberant. Um, here, here's another one. These are Western Zhao uh, dynasty. There they are. They're not big. They're only about three inches. But I love the way they're done. I love the hoofs. They almost look like high heels. And um, you have the, the stag looking back with this very animated, sort of exaggerated rack done off this. This is a, These are pendants, of course. And uh, just beautiful, beautiful quality. And uh, there's about 80 jades in here, 84 of them in the whole collection. And if you thought they, get, they sold all the good ones in the last sale, they didn't. This sale is just as good. I don't know where they get these. Um, they obviously uh, are being very careful about how they, 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 they sell this collection off. Um, and this is another great little uh, thing I saw, this dragon, uh, the dragon belt hook. Unbelievably uh, well done. Uh, estimated at sixteen to $23,000. It's not the world 
but I, the way the head is done and the ears, the quality of this carving is just superb. And it has its original bronze mounts. All right. Usually they're, they're cut off of these and then they're offered, you know, without them. I, I like it better with the mount on it. All righty. And then over here to Sotheby's, they have this is an interesting sale. Um, it's not terribly high price stuff, but it's a good look at what uh, Western collectors were able to buy during the latter part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century. This is the collection of um, Emil Haltmark, and he was a well known Swedish uh, collector uh, among those Western luminaries who were buying. And a lot of them were buying, they didn't know what they were buying really. They were sort of taking the dealers at their word for it because there wasn't a lot written in English for them to, to go by. So there were a few known experts, and there were a lot of letter writing, and a few books finally got published. And as we know now, a lot of the stuff that they thought was true wasn't true. Uh, they misdated things, not intentionally. They just didn't know. They were drawing assumptions. But this is a very interesting catalog. There's some interesting porcelain in here and some good bits of jade and not horrifyingly overpriced. And then you have the general Chinese art sale at Sotheby's, which is, is always is very good. And um, that's about it. Okay, so um, take a look at the catalogs. They're over at bitamount.com. I'll put a link down below so you can get over to it. And uh, we'll put a link for the catalogs. You can browse them all you want, enlarge them, shrink them, learn how to manipulate them. And uh, do read them. Do read them, though. All right. And if you haven't subscribed to us yet, please do. Um, we do these videos at least one a week. And when their auction's running, we do them more often. All right. We try to. We get, we. We're trying to run a business here, too, so we can't always get to everything that we want to necessarily, but, but we try. We try hard. All right, and uh, uh, subscribe to us here on YouTube. Leave a comment. Give us a thumbs up. And when these sales are completed, we'll come back and we'll do a, a, a look back and see how the prices came out and see if we can glean anything from the tea leaves of uh, what they bring. All righty. Thanks for visiting, and see you all next time. Bye-bye.